Kwame Omer, founder and executive director of MedTech Color. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event. It is a special day, it's International Women's Day. And of note, six of our 10 contestants and companies are women led. We've been able to build this community over the last couple of years and invest in nearly half a million dollars in capital and in-kind services to 20 brave, bold CEOs and companies. We couldn't have done this without our corporate partners, our community partners, and this amazing production team led by Scott in partnership with Scott, Karen, and Angie. But finally, I wanna thank our amazing core team, Ariana Albiar and Chaney Stennis. This wouldn't have happened without them. And with that, I am delighted to introduce to you the MCs for today, Dr. Angelique Johnson and Javier Evelyn. They're also founding members of MedTech Color. Angelique, Javier, are we ready to get started? Yep, excited to be here. Excited to hear these 10 teams pitch. Javier, how about you? I'm so excited. Um, it's been a year on year. Just the, the quality of candidates that have come in this year has just been amazing and I'm super excited. Um, it's gonna be an action-packed day. I know you're taking the first half of this, if I'm not mistaken, I'm taking the second half. Yeah. Um, we have some amazing prizes uh, to announce later on today. And then of course, we wanna get you as an audience involved. So stay tuned for that as well. Wonderful. So let's get it started first with introducing our judges. We want to welcome our judges here today, sacrificing their time, but I know it's not even that much of a sacrifice because they are excited to, as I am to hear the pitches of these wonderful businesses. So I want to briefly welcome Ricardo DeSantos, Naida Hanafi, Fiona Mack, and Sarah Cook. And you all will be seeing lots of them today as we go through these 10 pitches. And so let's go ahead and kick this off with our very first team, Free From Marketplace. Are you ready? Hi, I'm Emily Brown, founder and CEO of Free From Market. We're a digital health company in the food as medicine space, serving those who need it the most. I know this space inside and out. I've got two daughters that have chronic conditions where a special diet is required. Yet when we were on WIC and SNAP, we couldn't get the foods that we needed. So I started a nonprofit to get special dietary foods into food pantries. And that nonprofit is growing and doing well but I had the opportunity to work with hospitals, payers and patients and realized this is so much bigger than one nonprofit and there's a huge market opportunity. So I started Free From Market and in the last 12 months, we've built an MVP, launched in two hospital systems and are currently generating just under $40,000 in monthly recurring revenue. The foundation has been set and we're raising a $2 million seed to support our growth. Next slide. One in three Americans has a chronic condition where a specific diet is required, yet 50% really struggle with consistent access to the food and resources they need to be healthy. Next slide. Healthcare costs are exploding, and that's why everyone's turning to food as medicine. But most of this work has been done at the top of the pyramid in medically tailored meals or in vouchers for farmers markets, which is great, but difficult to scale. Where we see the biggest white space and opportunity in the market is in diet-specific grocery, the way Americans shop. Next slide. Free From Market delivers healthy food direct to door and telenutrition for positive behavior change. We're the only solution in the market with the closed loop system. And that's important because we follow the patient end to end, providing data back to measure health outcomes for our healthcare partners and consumer purchase behavior for food manufacturers. Next slide. We get paid $200 per month per user by our customers. And in return, our patients and members receive $155 shopping credit. And we have an excellent utilization rate with 80% of members shopping month over month and a strong gross margin at 35%. Currently 27% of users are purchasing above their voucher every month, allowing us to capture more of the wallet. Next slide. We are 100% focused on healthcare providers and CBOs, but we have significant expansion opportunity within healthcare, institutional purchasing and consumer pay. Next slide. We are building enterprise technology. Our CTO, Sean Fry, has built enterprise software and sold it to private equity. and is a former hospital CIO. He's leading our tech development, which will among other things, integrate within provider workflows. Next slide. We're surrounding ourselves with experts and we have deep experience on our team in healthcare, insurance, nutrition, and public health and operations. 
Next slide. Thank you for your time today and I welcome any questions. Wonderful, what an amazing way to kick off National Women's Day with an amazing pitch from Emily. So we're gonna launch right into the judging portion with our judges, Fiona Mack and Nida Hanafi. And so I'll let you all take it away. Remember that you get two minutes for Q&A. Thank you so much, really, Emily. Enjoyed the presentation. I just wanted to consider one, maybe two points. What's the current demographics of your current test drivers? And as you continue to potentially expand your model to more of the direct to consumer, how have you changed your price point to really address the families that really make less than $75,000 and are perhaps not spending as much on their monthly food budget? That's a great question. Currently, our demographics range with about 60% of our users uh, that are living in rural settings. And we have significant um, users that, that are in urban settings and we have broad demographics against all, de broad usership against all demographics. We are not selling at, at retail price, we're selling just below uh, retail price. So our users are expending their entire voucher and spending over, 27% are spending over their voucher. So they're able to capture and utilize more food options than they would just getting a voucher directly to a regular retail outlet on the platform. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, my question to you is how are you raising awareness about the problem you're trying to solve and how are you reaching your, your users or your clients? Yeah, so our customers are healthcare providers and community-based organizations. We are reaching them really through working directly with hospitals who are subsidizing access to patients through their social determinants of health work. These are hospitals that have capitated risk and that need benefits to support these patients. And so we're reaching out directly, um, going to conferences. We've, I've also done work in this area as a food insecurity researcher, publishing and co-authoring papers with several research institutions across the country. And so I have those deep connections and we're working, it's very sticky, because once we work with one hospital, we've built a strong pipeline that's bringing inbound requests because this is such a significant need in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. I don't yeah, see a clock. Yeah, I didn't see a clock, so I wasn't sure if we had time for just one more question. Just wanted to think the, the types of indications that you're trying to address really tying these back to health outcomes in order to get this level of reimbursement. So once again, tell us a bit more about the, the demographics and who's currently utilizing the services. Yeah, so right now what it looks like um, when we work with hospitals, we're starting with patients in the food allergy and GI space, okay. and we're measuring outcomes um, because these conditions, food is part of the standard of care. So we're looking at healthcare utilization as well as uh, quality of life measures. Thank you very much, Emily. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. Thank you uh, to our judges. Thank you, Emily, for your wonderful pitch. And we are moving right along to our next finalist, Candlelit Therapy. So Candlelit Therapy, are you ready, Lauren? Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Elliott, co-founder and CEO of Candlelit Therapy, where our mission is to make access to perinatal mental health care that's culturally competent, evidence-based, and peer-led, simple for Black, Indigenous, and POC, or BIPOC families. Next slide, please. Each year in the U.S., nearly half of BIPOC moms develop what's called a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder by the time their baby turns one. Unfortunately, half of these women will never receive treatment due to a lack of screening and diagnosis. I know because I was that mom. Here's a photo of my son and I just one day after bringing him into this world by a traumatic cesarean birth. This is only the beginning of my depression, but I didn't know that I was suffering in silence. Next slide, please. Millions of women of color across the country share stories like mine, and this inequity has only been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. This comes at a huge cost, societal and economic cost, to insurers and ultimately families. As you can see, we're filling a huge gap in a diverse market by addressing both maternal mental health screening and treatment. Next slide, please. Present day methods used to identify risk of mental illness are highly subjective and don't catch underlying and untreated symptoms experienced by BIPOC people, but we enable a more accurate and culturally sensitive care model. Parents learn about us during their pre and postnatal doctor's visits who refer them to our app for the right level of care at the right time. Next slide, please. We act as the glue between payers and their members throughout these four episodes of care to make handoffs between maternal and mental health care providers, 
more culturally sensitive, and to keep moms engaged in ongoing care. Next slide, please. Right now, we're piloting a tiered pricing model that's performance-based, where we charge payers per parent per episode of care, which makes us uniquely aligned with doctors who would get reimbursed each time a parent uses one of our care pathways over the span of two years. Next slide, please. We currently have two pilots for our flagship product, Kenelit Care, with the largest health system in Indiana and a New Jersey payer who both see us as a fit to reduce Black maternal health disparities. Black women in particular are less likely to be screened for things like PMAS, like depression and anxiety, to be honest when they are screened or to receive necessary treatment with or without a diagnosis. So our platform is crucial. Next slide, please. No one else has effectively engaged BIPOC parents in this way until now. We not only match moms with content that's approved by a Cedar sinai psychiatrist, but offer moms symptom education and a continuum of care that today is fragmented and delayed. Next slide, please. My experience with depression and as a public health professional has given me deep knowledge in this space. I've led million dollar mental health campaigns designed for communities of color, and I'm supported by a team of healthcare executives and clinicians. We've done a, next slide, please, sorry. We've done a lot with limited resources, but today are announcing a round of $1.5 million to scale candlelit care across two underserved markets in our pipeline. Thank you for your time. That's my presentation. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was wonderful. And you have judges Ricardo DeSantos and Fiona Mack coming up to give you a two minute Q&A session. First of all, hi, Lauren. Good to see you. Good to see you, Ricardo. Hope you're feeling good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, and yeah, thanks for bringing uh, mental health to the forefront, especially among underserved communities. My, my question is on your uh, core intellectual property. Can you tell us a bit more about how this content came about, how you put it together, with whom, and how um, specifically it is culturally relevant. Thanks. Thanks, Ricardo, for your question. Great question. Um, yes, yeah, so the content is uh, specifically for an eight-week program. It was co-developed with a psychiatrist who's our advisor. Uh, she's actually a Cedar sinai psychiatrist. What we're doing is we're having a foundation of cognitive behavioral therapy in the program, so that's at the foundation. But what we've done is culturally adapted. So not only are we addressing topics like breastfeeding and if whether or not a mom or parent needs a lactation specialist, but we're discussing things like ancestors or wet nursing. We're really tapping into the barriers and of stigma and access to content and wellness support that's actually relevant to the parents so that they know that this is a, an entire tech-enabled service that was designed specifically for thoughts that they may have, fears that they may have that may come up during their pregnancy and specifically after childbirth, um, since we know that that is a, a more sensitive window. Thank you. So uh, really wonderful presentation, Laura and I, I too gave birth about a year and a half ago during the, the pandemic to my, my first child. It's quite a, a daunting task and I was really appreciative of the immense care that I was given. So my comments are really about, while well, you have a great tool that really empowers women to think about their mental health, the, the flip side of that is also having an organization that you can, can trust. And part of what they, we don't understand about what particularly affect black women in, in uh, maternal health is that um, the healthcare system, do they, do they listen to us? How do you develop that level of trust? And so my question is really, how do you ensure like an educational practitioners that this is a issue that they can impact in addition to empowering the patient to own their own mental health? So that's a great question, Fiona. Yes. Yeah. So we specifically we specifically started with screening because of that fact. We know that the assessment there's a dis disparity specifically among Black and Brown women, and even just getting screening. We know they're less likely to be screened. And actually, to be honest, and that is that sometimes the distrust of a provider. So what we've done is we've armed that provider, those providers, with a way to screen in a culturally sensitive way. So not only are we asking standard questions that are clinical questions um, that are usually pulled from PHQ9 Edinburgh. But we are also layering artificial intelligence where we can have passive and active data be kind of transmitted to us. That way, the doctors can know who's a low risk, who's falling into the low risk categories, who's falling into the high risk. And these can have the doctors be alerted to know who to actually be more um, sensitive to, who to get into care right away. It's usually okay, the Lauren, gaps. In I am care. going to um, cut you off. We are out of time, yeah. but I think you Thank answered you that doing. question excellently. So I don't think we missed much information. Thank you to our judges, Fiona and Ricardo. And 
Awesome team, everybody all around. So next we're going up to Tab Diagnostics. So Tab, are you ready for us over here, Troy? Hi, I'm Troy Baring, the CEO and founder of Tab Diagnostic. And next slide, please. Our mission and vision is to empower diabetics to better manage and reverse diabetes. My wife is a type two diabetic, so I've seen the challenges firsthand. Next slide, please. Diabetes is growing and uncontrolled diabetes is linked to increased heart and kidney disease and so much more. The cost of treating complications is $380 billion. And type two diabetes accounts for 90% of all cases. Next slide, please. Achieving A1C levels delays the progression of diabetes and related complications, reducing costs. More than 50% of patients want to do more to achieve their A1C goals, but they just don't. And failure to initiate or escalate therapy is a major barrier. Next slide, please. Physicians today use A1C measurements every 90 days to intensify treatment. Blood glucose monitors are rarely used. Continuous glucose monitors can be used, but they're not available to almost 80% of diabetics. Glycine protein measurements are used today to intensify treatment faster than A1C measurements. Unfortunately, there are no home tests available. Next slide, please. Our solution is a point-of-care saliva-based glycated albumin protein test. Uh, we have promising preclinical study data that demonstrates glycated albumin in saliva is equivalent to glycated albumin in blood. Our system consists of a disposable cassette and dropper and a reusable reader and phone app. The assay is a novel graphene field effect transistor that is uh, able to quantify glycated protein in saliva in just minutes. We have an exclusive license with our partner and our partner has intellectual property that consists of 33 patents. Next slide, please. Our focus will be on the 208 million diabetics seeking treatment in the top markets, then prediabetes and undiagnosed diabetes. Next slide, please. We expect to leverage reimbursement within 18 to 24 months. And at $600 uh, from a cost standpoint, our uh, device will be more attractive than the $1,500 that uh, patients currently pay today. And we expect to be at $150 million by uh, year five. Next slide, please. Our team is very experienced, having launched uh, numerous products through 510K and PMA. Uh, our advisors are experienced as well in the diabetes space. Uh, next slide, please. Our roadmap starts with endocrinologists. Uh, they're already familiar, familiar with glycated protein and reimbursement. Uh, then we'll expand to prescription use at home and then to the primary care, care physician, then, then to consumers. Uh, next slide, please. And our ask is for $3.5 million over 20 months to reach FDA submission. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Troy. We are being joined by our judges, Sarah Cook. And again, appearing again as our judge, Nida Hanafi. So they're going to give you a session. And, and just as a reminder to all finalists, try to keep your responses as brief as possible because we want to hear as much about your company as we can. Great. Um, thanks for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, can you speak a little bit about how you envision reaching, reaching patients? You spoke a little bit about hitting doctors first, um, but then do you also have a plan for insurance providers and then any direct to patient marketing? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, for some people that are familiar with that diatribe, they're actually a, a patient-based subscriber uh, service that they link with uh, diabetics. So we would actually work with them to make sure as we work with physicians, we would survey them and see what type of technology they need at home. And then from a reimbursement standpoint, today glycated protein is already reimbursed. And so uh, again, endocrinologists who are the experts in diabetes, they would actually share that information with their patient, patients and then we would share it with primary care, care physicians who most di uh, diabetics see firsthand. Great, thank you. Thank you, Troy. You're clearly addressing a very un, you know, huge unmet need within um, different racial and ethnic groups. So you mentioned FDA. I'm curious to understand whether you know what um, your pathway to market would look like, what class you'd be regulated on. Yes, thank you. That's a great question. Right now, uh, we are going to be a class two device. Uh, we're going to go the de novo route. You know, the big challenge for us is obviously uh, glycated protein and serum or blood is well established. We have to show that our technology saliva is equivalent, uh, which is why we would do the de novo approach. And uh, our stats say right now we need between 100 and 160 patients to be able to show that. Okay. 
can I add in a follow on question? So how do you imagine um, getting uptake or inclusion of this tool in the current clinical work? Uh, that's a great question. Right now, we know that uh, type 2 diabetics are really frustrated with uh, glucose monitoring. And since most don't qualify for continuous glucose monitoring, this is going to be a great solution to them. So once we work with the endocrinologists, who, as you probably can imagine, since they're a small group, they're overwhelmed. Uh, so they're going to be able to provide, uh, prescribe this to their patients. And we expect that uh, this is going to be a better alternative than uh, finger pricks, since there's no pain, you can do it at home. And then plus your doctor will actually use the information. Uh, so we see a, a pretty substantial uptake very quickly. Thank you. We are all out of time for questions. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And we're going to move on to our next company, Sunny. And uh, Sunny, are you ready? Cindy, are you ready to, to launch your pitch? Yes. Thank you so much. First slide, please. Happy to be here. Sunny is a self-care brand delivering the first menstrual cup that can be inserted like a tampon together with our honest education and global give back, we are revolutionizing period care. My name is Cindy and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sunny. Next slide, please. We're entering the 1.5 billion global menstrual cup industry that's growing twice as fast as tampons and pads combined. We know that right now is the best time to enter this market because people are realizing the issues with current products. Next slide, please. A majority of people use tampons and pads, but they're costly, unsustainable, and have harmful chemicals. Menstrual cups have been around since the 1930s, but they're intimidating and thus have a low adoption rate. 73% of tampon users we surveyed said that they'd use a cup if it were user-friendly, effective, and comfortable. Next slide, please. That's exactly what we've done in our solution, the Sunny Cup and Applicator, the first menstrual cup to insert it like a tampon. 88% of our beta testers said that they'd use our cup over any other on the market. We're currently patent pending for our unique innovative design. Next slide, please. We know that with our design and our unique positioning, we have what it takes to stand out from our competitors. We're specifically targeting young tampon users, 16 to 26 years old, based in the US. Next slide, please. This target demographic is online, Gen Z. So we're serving them direct to consumer through Instagram and TikTok. We're looking at future buy one, give one models uh, just to be in line with what this consumer sees as very important. Next slide, please. This translates to a $400 million revenue opportunity for our beachhead and an $80 billion revenue opportunity globally. Next slide, please. We know that because we found this gap in the market, and how to trans and um, to capture current tampon users and make the switch to menstrual cups, we are confident that with our $39.99 price point and 75% gross margin, we'll be doing about 1.04 million in revenue by the first year of launch. Our next big steps here are in our regulatory manufacturing and marketing our cup. Next slide, please. This is a bit of the opportunity to launch the Sunny Cup and Applicator by the end of this year. And you can see those big three milestones highlighted here. Our pre-seed raise is 350K with a 12 month runway to achieve these next big milestones. Next slide, please. And together with our team, my co-founder Drew Jarvis and our team of experts and advisors in the field, we have surveyed and spoken to over 50,000 potential uh, customers. We have done global menstrual cup research and we have just worked alongside brand management uh, leaders in this space. So that gives us the confidence to show us we are really developing the best cup for our customers. Thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cindy. So we have Judges Ricardo back with us and Sarah Cook as well. So do you all want to launch your two-minute Q&A session? Hi, Cindy. Hope you're doing well. Uh, yeah. First of all, impressive amount of research and unbelievable design thinking going into what you're doing. Um, it's good to see that. Uh, as the only male judge on the panel, I'm also actually glad that I was put on the women's sexual health um, uh, startup. As, you know, we've got to break the biases at some point, right? Um, so I have a question on um, how you'd answer, how you really differentiate yourself from the competition. I understand um, 
the, the design factor, the usability as far as the applicator. But there, I have you know Googled around and Flirty, you know, for example, exists. So how would you know how would you summarize how you really are going to stand out in this market? Sure. Thanks for your question, Ricardo. So yeah, uh, aside and and further from our unique innovation, which is the only menstrual cup with an applicator that's used in this tampon-like fashion, we are targeting this young demographic of Gen Z menstrual cup users who were um, who are first using tampons. So we're really looking to that as our unique position, and that's what goes further than just the the design itself. Go ahead, I had a follow-up question. So um, I like that you address the insertion issue um, with the applicator, but what about removing the cup? Um, is there anything that kind of differentiates your product from a standard menstrual cup and how you typically would remove a standard cup? Yeah, so that's a great question too. Um, right now, what we've done in our surveys is really hone in on the issues that we've seen people have. And the main intimidation factor there is with the insertion process. So that's what we've innovated on with this applicator, this reusable applicator piece. And our menstrual cup is akin to the same removal process as other menstrual cups. The only difference there is that our menstrual cup has some thinner walled sections that allows it to fold up as thin enough to be inserted into this applicator. Great, um, I have a little question if there's time. Um, are there any concerns around, I guess, how you would keep your applicator clean if you're carrying it around in your purse or um, in a backpack? Sure, so we are working on the materials there, all medical grade and uh, body safe, but essentially what is needed is just to rinse with unscented soap between uses and um, it'll be good to go after that. Wonderful, so we are all the time for questions. Thank you so much to Cindy, thank you to Ricardo, thank you to Sarah, and we are going to move on to our fifth finalist. Uh, we're moving right along. And so Dialysis X, we are ready to hear your pitch and excited for it. My name is Ni Kweni. My company eliminates needles to deliver better outcomes in dialysis. Next slide, please. You see, dialysis is a life-saving treatment for patients suffering kidney failure. Majority of patients receive an access vessel called a fistula or graft, which is frequently punctured by needles in order to access the bloodstream. Next, please. And although needles are used to perform dialysis, they cause complications that severely impact patients' quality of life. These complications create a cycle of hospitalizations, increased cost and revenue loss to providers and payers. Additionally, the safety risk and training requirements of needle use severely limit the adoption of home dialysis, despite being more clinically effective and cost efficient. Next, please. To address this problem, Dialysis X is developing a needle-free access device that uses a novel coupling mechanism to safely and easily perform dialysis without incidences of needle dislodgement. It resolves the complications by eliminating intravascular trauma and maintaining normal blood parameters both of which are conditions for a healthy access vessel. Next, please. In our first three years of commercialization, we predict a 10% reduction in patient complications. This immediately translates to providers capturing $541 million in annual revenue, income that is now being lost without our device. We would also grow the home dialysis market by 10% from its current value. Next, please. Regulatory and market forces have aligned in our favor. The federal government's new kidney health policy demands innovations like ours in order to satisfy its aggressive objectives. Also, recent acquisitions with the largest dialysis care providers indicate a bullish outlook on the $3 billion home dialysis market. And lastly, the science behind the origin of dialysis complications has become clear and needles are central. Next. The number of Americans on hemodialysis is more than the population of residents in Miami, Florida. The market is driven by risk factors like obesity, cardiovascular disease, as well as the need for a private space during a pandemic. So, we are servicing the $1.3 billion US market and intend to initially focus on the smaller segment of patients using an AB grant at the VA clinic or a teaching hospital. Next please. I am an engineer with broad experiences ranging from medical devices to business development. Dr. Faber is the Chief of Vascular Surgery at the Boston Medical Center and brings his expertise in nephrology to our team. Next. We're actively raising the $500,000 pre-seed funding round 
to prove technical viability in 2022 before ramping up to animal studies. Next. Listen, a decade from today, kidney failure will no longer be a death sentence for dialysis patients because not only would our device obviate the need for needles, our integrated data platform would equally save more lives than you can imagine. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. So now we have judges Fiona and Sarah that are gonna give you some Q and A. So thank you again for a wonderful presentation. I just want to maybe, can you describe a bit more what the, the cost of goods are for your device and how can it incorporate into existing hemodialysis dialysis machines? Yes, yeah, so for us, we're selling at 1,100 and that includes the device is really two parts. There's an implantable part that's going to sell for about $700, which is relative really compared to the cost of an AV draft. And the other part of the device, which is the dialysis card, it's single use. And so just like needles, similar business models, similar pricing as well, um, for a pack of enough for eight months, that would go for the rest of the balance. That's about $500, dollars yeah. I was actually curious if the, the cost of goods, how much will it cost you to, to manufacture them? And do they incorporate into all dialysis machines, both at home and then the clinic? Yes, so to answer your second question first, they do incorporate into all of the dialysis facilities, uh, machines that are being used, well, specifically the hemodialyzer, which is really what we're connecting to because the connector box is already implanted. Uh, the prior question about the cost of goods, so our selling price and then discount that by uh, 10 15 percent gross margin that's how we're working on numbers so uh thanks again for your, your presentation um one of my questions was around potential infection is that a concern with the device and, and how you're kind of keeping it closed in between treatments yeah you're spot on sir that's definitely a question for everybody and the way we're solving that is using a number of approaches well the first one is using and antibacterial, really bactericidal materials for our device. So that's on one hand, and more specifically targeting first off with um, infections like Staphylococcus aureus, which is um, the most popular infection that dialysis patients come down with. But we're also using the closed loop design. And just as importantly as all of these approaches is the fact that the dialysis caps are single use. So it's supposed to be used once and then disposed of, and that would also help with keeping infections out. Thank you. So we're all out of time for questions, but that's excellent. Thank you so much, Dialysis X. Thank you to our judges. And we are going to, um, at this point, actually have a video from our community partner. But I do want to give a special thank you to all of the judges um, and the participants in this first half, Neta Hanafi, Ricardo Dos Santos, Sarah Cook, and Fiona Mack, um, before we have a wonderful short video from one of our community partners. Hello, I'm Kwame Omer, founder and executive director of MedTech Color, and I'm delighted to be here with David Winter. David is the project leader for BARDA's Accelerator Network and Blue Knight uh, Incubator Program in collaboration with JLabs. He's going to share a bit about BARDA and the value they provide for startups. David? Sure. Thanks, Kwame. So BARDA develops and makes available medical countermeasures against a variety of threats in the health security space, be they a pandemic responses or man-made threats like biological, chemical, nuclear threats. And we do this by forming unique public-private partnerships to drive the innovation from the bench to the patient to save lives. We, as an example, in the last 20 months, have supported the development and the emergency use authorization of three vaccines against COVID-19 four different therapeutics and over 20 different vaccine diagnostic test kits. And we do this through a variety of methods through both direct support, but especially with small startups, we use our accelerator network to both support the innovators as well as the small businesses themselves as they develop their products and their business. And we use our incubator space to actually provide physical space for startups in that health security space to develop their product and their company. And if you want to know more about us, you can simply Google BARDA and check out our pages. Well, that's wonderful, David. And I'm sure many of our participants will uh, look up BARDA and learn more. Thanks, David.
Thank you and good luck everybody in the competition. Thanks so much to our community partners over at Barter. We're super grateful to your support. And you know, it really takes a village to raise a startup in health tech. Um, so in addition to Barter and the good folks there, we're super grateful to all of our sponsors uh, throughout, uh, as we'll talk about later on. And we have some amazing specialized prizes as well. Um, don't forget later on, we want your input as the audience. You're gonna play as angel investors for lack of a better phrase. Uh, you'll see a pop-up come up in a bit uh, later on at the end of our next five uh, finalists. And we look forward to your support throughout the rest of this. You know, kind of moving into the rest of this uh, amazing pitch uh, so far, uh, getting this kicked back off for the second half, I'm pleased to introduce Allergen IQ, uh, finalist number six. You know, the, the floor is all yours and we look forward to hearing from you. We are in an allergy care crisis in which the rates of allergic conditions have literally quadrupled in the past decade, costing the healthcare system a hundred and $50 billion. These patients have a suboptimal quality of life. 89% of food allergic individuals avoiding restaurants due to the fear of a life-threatening allergic reaction. The healthcare system that we live in is broken. And to compound this problem even further, there are not enough of us allergists to deal with this increasing demand. And this is how Allergen IQ was born. Next slide, please. Allergen IQ is a virtual allergy care platform that allows patients to interact with the allergist-led team of dietitians, coaches, and therapists via an app for prevention. We use predictive analytics in order to provide actionable symptom management and preventive management tips. Lastly, we send our customized immunotherapy regimen directly to the patients, which results in a 30% cost saving as opposed to the traditional allergy care model. Let me show you how this works. Next slide, please. Emily is a one-year-old who awoke with swollen eyes and wheezing in her lungs. And instead of her parents having to wait three to four weeks to see a board certified allergist, they're able to jump on the app, get diagnosed and have customized treatment delivered directly to their home. Next slide, please. There are 80 million individuals that suffer from chronic allergic conditions. And when you look in the workforce, there are 47 million individuals. Next slide, please. Our target customer are self-funded employers and virtual primary care clinics, and we generate revenue from our membership model. We believe in equitable access for all. And so we also target individuals via an insurance model. Next slide. We feel that our comprehensive model is uh, well differentiated from any other model due to the fact that we manage allergy, asthma, and eczema, and food allergy, as well as use predictive analytics in order for the customer to be able to endure preventative tips. Next slide. We are currently in talks with a pilot, a virtual private care pilot for this fall that has over 100,000 members. Next slide, please. We are currently raising $1 million that will give us an 18 month runway and the funds we use for our platform, our social media and our marketing. Next slide. I lead the team as a pediatric allergist and the mother of two children of life-threatening food allergies. We also have 30 years of allergy immunology experience, technology experience, and we are healthcare executives with a unique expertise in the pair space. Thank you for this, this um, talk. Well done, love the energy. Way to kick us off, Dr. Mariku. I wanna reintroduce our next judges for this moment, uh, Netta, as well as Ricardo. Have at it, y'all. How do you plan to reach the most um, at need patient population? Can you really hone in on who that market sector is? Can you repeat the question, how do I plan to reach who? Your, your, key, your key clients or your key customers? So our key customers are twofold. We're going to reach self-funded employer plans. And the way we're going to do that is really by targeting the HR managers, by providing webinars and really educating how much they're losing due to allergy chronic diseases. They are not aware that obstructive sleep apnea is a cause. Asthma, eczema are all related to allergic diseases. They're not aware that their employees are having decreased productivity, increased absenteeism from their allergic diseases. So we're gonna start with education, with the HR managers in order to reveal a product. Thank you. Hi, Nana, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? Good, good to see you. Um, so I, I just wanted to maybe um, double down on the last question, but ask you more specifically how you plan to address health equity issues 
and namely, you know, making sure that your solution is usable, accessible, and affordable to all. That's a great question. And so, and that's a great question for mul multiple reasons. Food allergies, asthma, eczema, and seasonal allergies are disproportionately affecting people of color. And when we have these allergies diseases, we are the one who have who bear most of the burden. And so that's initially who I'm targeting. We will target them through awareness and education of the problem. Also, this is why for our direct to consumer um, response, we are going to employ insurances for the direct consultation, for the breathing tests, and for the treatment. Can I ask, how about patients who don't have insurance? It seems like you, you're going at a subset that have access, but those who don't, who might be disproportionately impacted and benefit. Very good question. And so you can also, we do have a self-payment model. And for that initial consultation, that would be a self-payment model. And for the treatment, there will also be a payment model from cash. And are you taking into account different SES um, uh, population, socioeconomic status who might, you know, is it a tiered paid model? We're taking into account the socioeconomic status for each model. So for different treatments, there's tablets, there's immunotherapy, all of them have a different payment point. And our goal is if we can identify the underlying treatment, we know that we have three different tools in order to manage the diseases at different costs. And so we're gonna meet them where they're at. Well done, well done. Thanks so much to our judges. Thanks so much, Dr. Mariku, for that wonderful presentation. We're looking forward to um, hearing more from the rest of our panelists and the rest of our panelists at this point as well too. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce SealCath. Uh, Cephas, the floor is all yours. Hi, my name is Cephas Simmons, and I'm the uh, founder and CEO of SealCath. My story started one day when I was called in to do an interception reduction procedure. Interception is when a bowel telescopes upon itself and it causes a bowel obstruction. In order to remove or reduce this bowel obstruction, we have to um, have a catheter that we can seal off the rectum and push that bowel back into place. Well, during my procedure, we were doing a, using a, a latex catheter, which is a um, Foley catheter. And the Foley catheter during the entire procedure leaked uh, all around it. Um, it took us 40 minutes to, to complete the procedure, um, which usually takes us about 20 minutes. Um, so after this, I realized that there was a problem and I vouched to myself that I would fix this problem, whether I'll find another product that's there or I'll create one. Um, and I couldn't find one, so I created, created a problem. I mean, a catheter. And that catheter is the Cephas catheter. And the Cephas catheter is the only double balloon colorectal catheter that's on the market. Um, it is uh, patented and cleared by the FDA. Um, this catheter has a unique design, and this balloon um, provides an optimal rectal seal that provides us uh, the capability that we need to decrease the procedure time and to all, all the, and allow us to visualize small cancerous or precancerous lesion in the colon. Oh, by the way, that uh, procedure that took 40 minutes was completed in three minutes with the Cephas catheter. Next slide, please. We are, we are targeting to capture um, 10 to 25, 35% of the market of the listed applications or procedures um, within 24 months with a, uh, a annual sales of about 61.5 million. Next slide, please. We're currently a business model. We have two FTAs. We have two companies that's making the product and we're selling right now to radiology department within medical centers and hospitals. Next slide, please. So our market strategy now is that we're selling directly to radiology. Um, we're looking to add on some other specialties within the upcoming year. Um, our focus right now is using uh, professional conferences, social media and a uh, company's website as marketing and sales are being conducted by SealCath and its partnering distributors. Next slide, please. Our team consists of myself and Amelia. Um, we have over 60 years of medical and business experience and we are uh, backed up by a, a strong team of administrators which have over 100 years of experience in the uh, selected areas within the uh, realm that we're looking for for our company. Next slide, please. The funding we're looking for will go toward uh, working capital, product expansion, inventory, and various other listing on this slide. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to any questions. Great job, Cephas and SealCath. I want to reintroduce our judges, Sarah, as well as Netta, for your feedback as well. Thanks so much. Um, is there any impact to existing reimbursement? Or is the selling benefit here really improved operating efficiency and, and um, shortened procedural time? 
Great question, Sarah. Actually, there are they are actually there's a better process here now. Um, the CFIS catheter is reimbursable. It has a reimbursement code. Um, the catheter that they were using off market, the Foley catheter, does not have a reimbursement. Um, so actually, there's a, a gain quality of uh, profit for having the uh, CFIS catheter. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. So you have a cleared product. Um, can you talk about how the market acceptance of this product has been? Can you Absolutely. hear me okay? Yes, I can now. It was breaking out a little bit, but yeah, actually, uh, the market is actually great. That's why we came out first with the, with the latex version, which is a little cheaper to make, um, to see what the traction is. And now that we are gaining a lot of traction and getting a lot of requests for um, silicon version, we're coming out with a silicon version that will, will benefit all the patients. Uh, we had some patient that had allergy to latex, so couldn't use it. So the demand is actually there and the traction is there um, for our new product that's coming out this year that will uh, be focused on all patients. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, I, and will you need to have a clearance for that new silicone uh, base? No, the uh, the clearance will be the same. I just have to submit the, uh, the, the uh, requirements to the FDA, but it's still a class one clearance product. All right, unless we have any other questions, thanks so much, COCAT. Thanks so much, Cephas, Ned, and Sarah for your inputs as well, too. Um, moving right along, we're almost at, uh, at the end of this, and I'm having a great time so far. Get ready for some voting coming soon, y'all. Uh, so introducing finalist number eight, uh, New Gen DX. I'd like to introduce Bemi of New Gen DX. The floor is all yours. My name is Bemi Ogunyomi, CEO of New Gen DX. I'd like to introduce you to our rock star team at New Gen, comprised of MDs and engineers with prior experience leading VC-backed med device startups with two successful exits and one IPO. Next slide, please. Vaginitis is the second most common reason for a gynecological visit in the United States, with 55% of women experiencing recurring infections up to six times a year. Vaginal infections left untreated could lead to greater health issues such as recurrent UTIs, infertility, and even cervical cancer. Next slide, please. There are only two OBGYNs for every 10,000 women in the United States. This results in a wait time of up to 21 days for the examination of a patient including an additional five days for the shipment, processing, and results transfer from external lab facilities back to the OBGYN for review. Next slide, please. Nugen is developing an AI-assistive med device platform that enables same-day sample collection, processing, and treatment of vaginitis at the point of care. Next slide, please. Our competitors use PCR technology for vaginitis detection at external lab facilities. Their technology is costly to develop, takes hours for processing, and the hardware is too bulky to be used at the point of care. Our technology, on the other hand, is cheaper to develop using artificial intelligence. Our results are processed in seconds, and our hardware device is small and portable enough to be used at the point of care. Next slide, please. Our regulatory pathway is to first develop an ai assisted class one device to detect yeast infections only. The second iteration of our technology would be a class two device fully automated for a complete vaginitis testing panel. Next slide, please. This table shows our competitors fees for a women's health testing panel. As you can see, the total cost per patient is $250. We use this information to determine our revenue model shown in the next slide. Next slide, please. So our class one device will be sold directly to consumers as retail pharmacies and online, while our class two devices will be distributed in hospitals and will receive reimbursements from medical insurance companies for our complete testing panels. Next slide, please. We're currently working with key industry experts in the clinical med device and digital health space, such as Stanford Te Texas Medical Center Innovation, Dr. In Demand and McKisson to help develop, test and bring our product to market. Next slide, please. We have filed a lot of patents, developed a proof of concept device with it's coupled with its AI model for vaginitis detection, and are now raising a pre-seed round of 3.5 million to com complete our key technical and clinical milestones, including low volume manufacturing of our class one device and a small MVP launch in Palo Alto, California. Next slide, please. Finally, our company is projected to be worth north of 100 million in five years. We have a rocky st hockey stick and that's what matters. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs>
Well done, well done, Bambi of New Gen. Once again, I want to reintroduce Fiona and Ricardo to get some feedback and have some Q and A. Floor is all yours. Um, I just wanted to know, understand a little bit more about the potential use of this device as a direct to consumer and at home diagnostic. I think one of your advantages is not only time, but there could be privacy, particularly for these reoccurring infections. So, how are you able to maybe reduce the, the price point to really make this a true at home diagnostic? Thank you for the question, absolutely. Um, so our device, like I mentioned, is using artificial intelligence. That's the main key sauce here, which are most of the cost for that is just the data, data acquisition. Once that is done, actually to produce the device itself is um, about $20, 15 to $20. And the testing cartridges um, would be only a couple cents. So that puts our price point like really low um, for the consumers at home. Hi, hi, Bimmy. Um, good, good to meet you. Um, by the way, I, that hockey stick looks kind of normal. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe it could be higher. It looks like you have a big, big idea. I have lots of questions, but I guess I would ask you about reimbursement. Given that this is a different method, how confident are you that the, the current reimbursement um, amounts for, for the current panels uh, would apply to, to your method? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we did a lot of, um, we got regulatory consultants and we did our, um, did our uh, regulatory pathway strategy for this. And we were able to find that Quest Diagnostics, uh, our competitors are able to use this PCR testing um, for reimbursements from medical insurance companies. So we would be a cheaper option for those insurance companies and that would be our road to market. Awesome. Well, well done all. Thanks again, Bambi and team. Thanks so much to our judges as well, too. We're going to keep it going at this point. We're at finalist number nine at this point, right? So uh, I want to introduce Dietech Diabetes led by Luis. Uh, Luis, um, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luis Blanco, and I'm a proud Hispanic from Placetas Via Clara Cuba, and I'm a co-founder and CTO for Dietech Diabetes, and we are revolutionizing infusion safety for people who use insulin pump technology. I want to start off by introducing you to my co-founder, John, who was diagnosed with type 1 on his ninth birthday and has actually had the disease for over 15 years. John is one of over 1 million pump users worldwide that rely on, on the technology to manage their diabetes. While some consider insulin pumps to be the first cure for diabetes, they are not perfect. Next slide. In 2018, the Associated Press released an article that brought to attention the fact that insulin pumps have had the highest number of malfunction, injury, and death reports within the FDA's medical device database. One of the most concerning issues is related to the infusion delivery failures. And as you can see here, they can present themselves in many different ways, but all have, to have the ability to lead to severe loss of blood sugar control, increased care costs, and can even be fatal. Next slide. If caught in time, a bad infusion site can be changed before any adverse event takes place. Unfortunately, there is still too much room for error when it comes to infusion monitoring. We believe that no one should die because they're not aware of a compromised infusion site. Next slide. For these reasons, we are building Smart Fusion, an AI-powered infusion monitoring software platform for insulin pumps. Next slide, please. Smart Fusion is designed to be integrated onto a user's insulin pump or on a connected device and works by leveraging existing data streams, including onboard sensors on their insulin pump. Using our proprietary set of algorithms, the software evaluates every delivery event as it occurs and tracks the user's delivery efficiency in near real time. This allows us to detect an infusion issue before an adverse event takes place. Alerts are pushed via an app and all the data is accessible via our online uh, clinical dashboard. Next slide, please. On average, it can take up to 24 hours for an insulin pump to detect an inclusion at the site. Under certain conditions, that number can grow to over three days. Our latest preclinical testing shows that smart fusion is not only capable of detecting the market standard, which is occlusions, but, all, but other types of failures as well. We have a 93% classification accuracy when it comes to detecting these alert failure modes and can do this within 30 seconds of your last infusion. We believe that every single pump on the market can benefit from having Smart Fusion integrated into their system. And that's why we have designed it to be pump agnostic and easily licensable. Next slide, please. Another advantage is that our team is highly experienced in clinical diabetes work and medical device software development. But most importantly, our entire leadership has a direct personal connection to diabetes and insulin pump therapy. Next slide. In the future, Smart Fusion can be licensed to an insulin pump manufacturer to enhance their system's infusion monitoring capabilities and help them retain and acquire patients who are struggling with infusion failures. All of this without the need for additional hardware. In return, Dietech generates revenue based on the licensing fee. We are now completing our preclinical testing that is, that is funded by the NIH Phase 1 grant. We're one of the youngest teams to ever receive this grant, and it was our first time um, with the award. 
we're on, on track to raise our $1.3 million seed um, by the end of this year and hope to enter the market by 2023. Last slide. At Dietech, we are personally committed to bettering the quality of life for people with diabetes. Join us in our mission to improve insulin infusion monitoring. Thank you. Well done, perfect timing, Luis, and thanks so much, Dietech Diabetes. I want to reintroduce Ricardo and Sarah for some Q&A. Hi, Luis. Um, Hi, Ricardo. Congrats on your uh, progress so far. Um, so I have, a, I have a lot of questions. Um, you made things uh, pretty clear, uh, your strategy of being tech inside the current in, um, insulin pump makers. Can you tell us about what feedback or insights you've heard directly from them now, I'd be curious uh, if you touched on this uh, essentially negative aspect of, of their pumps that they can fail. And you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's shining a light where uh, perhaps they might not want to be shined uh, on, on these high failure rates. So but just tell me about the feedback from them and, and how that's might affected what you're doing now and we'll do in the future. Thanks. It's a great question. So we actually had an insulin pump manufacturer write a letter of support for our uh, NIH submission. So we know it, they understand what we're doing and, and they want to be part of the solution. We're actually meeting with another one tomorrow morning. So we think that they understand and see the value of bringing this kind of feature to market. Where we see the diabetes evolving to and insulin pump technology going, we want to get it so that it's fully automated. So we can relinquish that burden from the patient, put it onto the device. We cannot do that until we saw the fact that you know, we don't have great infusion failure detection. We see this as, as the first feature of our infusion monitoring platform. And we think that there's a lot to gain from incorporating this kind of technology. So we don't see it as pointing the finger as if there's a problem. We see it as a maturing of the technology um, from where we, we are to, to where we should be going. Can you speak a little bit more about your, your licensing model and how you kind of validated uh, your business model strategy? So right now with the with the licensing, we are a um, we're very focused on the on the research and development. We have a hardware system that we use primarily for research uh, data collection, uh, but we we realize that it, it's a lot better if we just go the software route, right? Because patients don't want another hardware, manufacturers don't want to have increased or burden for manufacturing. Uh, so we figured a software is, is the easiest platform. Right now we have two two main strategies, which is the licensing model of our flow first uh, platform, so infusion monitoring. Um, and we see that as, as we need to mature the technology first before we're ready for a commercialization strategy. While we're getting there, we're actually in progress now of we have our I set on a pilot, which we hope to launch by the end of this year, if not early next year, where we can um, provide a similar type of benefit with the infusion monitoring, retrospective data analysis through our dashboard system. So this is a way to enter the market without having to um, manage the barrier that is partnership with the manufacturer, and we can see if the market is ready and, and wants this kind of feature. Great, thank you. Well done, Luis, and Dietech Diabetes. Thanks so much again to Ricardo and uh, Sarah. Um, this time went by really fast, y'all. I wish we had way more uh, to go through, but again, um, we're gonna have a little bit more interaction in a little bit. Uh, but before getting into that, last but not least, I'd like to introduce finalist number 10, uh, Wendy of BTEC. Uh, Wendy. The floor is all yours and closes Thank out you. with a bang. Thank you for the introduction. Within a span of three years, I saw my mom lose both of her legs to diabetic foot ulcers. Conventional therapies failed her. Next slide, please. Between 15 and 25% of all diabetics will develop a diabetic foot ulcer and approximately five to 8% of them will have an amputation. Next slide, please. Current technologies only close wounds on the surface layer. They don't prevent infections, they're expensive, and they don't repair the damaged tissue or strengthen the skin. Light therapies, on the other hand, can be used to heal wounds from the inside out, but they're expensive, they're bulky, they require trained medical personnel and multiple visits to the doctor's office. Next slide, please. BTEC miniaturizes light therapy into the Halcyon Smart Patch, which can easily be placed anywhere on the body and improves healing and has the potential to prevent amputation from diabetic foot ulcers. Rather than a big laser, our patent pending patch uses nanotechnology to transform far infrared light into heat to increase the blood flow and activate the natural wound healing process. Overall, the patch strengthens the skin, prevents infections and repairs the damaged tissue from the inside out. Next slide, please. The potential to save lives and build a thriving business from this small patch is huge. The chronic wound market is a $20 billion TAM. Of this, BTEC is initially servicing 300
5,000 patients with diabetic foot ulcers as young as the age of 18, representing a $240 million SAM. Next slide, please. BTEC will target five high volume wound care centers, seeing on average 4,000 patients with diabetic foot ulcers for $3.2 million per wound center in the US. As we grow, we can serve the 1,000 outpatient wound care centers in the US. Next slide, please. So far, we have developed a preliminary prototype and collected data from animal studies with rodents that have shown that the device can retain and distribute heat and initiate the tissue healing process. With your support, BTEC will follow the FDA 510K class two pathway to commercialize the Halcyon Smart Patch by 2025. Next slide, please. We have a strong team who provide a mix of integrative medicine, wound research, clinical trials, and business commercialization expertise. Next slide, please. BTEC is currently raising a $3 million seed round to build clinical trial prototypes, finalize our IP, expand on our animal studies, make critical initial hires, and lease lab space. Next slide, please. I'm Wendy Sloan of BTEC, and as a scientist and entrepreneur who saw her mom lose both her legs to diabetic foot ulcers, I'm committed to advancing the wound care space. Please join BTEC in saving the legs and the lives of the 7 million sufferers of diabetes, foot ulcers, and chronic wounds. Thank you. Um, I guess for our last round of uh, q and I want to ring back uh, Netta as well as Fiona, and then we'll get into some additional uh, special conversations and prizes in a bit. Thanks so much. Um, can you talk a little bit about who your competitors are and who you would be uh, claiming substantial equivalence to? Uh, thank you for the question. Our, our competitors are primarily the big lasers. So if you look at a Thor laser, which is about the size of an ultrasound, there are also LED laser light that are clinical grade like Jovi that are our direct competitors. Um, there are some smaller handheld ones that per, um, focus on like psoriasis and eczema, but nothing that is looking at closing wounds. Uh, thank you so much, Wendy. A uh, related question, I was curious about the design of this pivotal trial uh, that you would have to show for, for class two, uh, what's going to be the comparator in that study. And uh, separately, I'm also wearing my, my Johnson Johnson hat here. Uh, what about using this in a general consumable, like in a, a Band-Aid for general wound healing? How would that uh, maybe change your development practice? And those are good questions. Um, again, our direct competitor is um, the laser light therapies themselves, the big bulky ones, because we want to miniaturize that and put it into a friendly, mobile friendly user patch, which is um, what we have um, been able to accomplish with the prototype. And uh, again, yes, we are looking to pivot the technology into um, other areas of usage. But right now to um, address your question, we can consider ourselves as a companion product that can be used with current um, um, dry, wet, um, high, hyperbaric um, chambers, um, and if you're using any kind of um, map gels or anything like that, uh, because the product can be placed not over the wound, it's not designed for that, it's um, designed to be placed like on the calf of the leg, if it's a foot ulcer, or it can be placed up higher on the wrist, um, and that's by design because most people have comorbidity of being obese with diabetic foot ulcers, and they can't um, always properly dress the wounds, so we want to come in as a companion to those other traditional conventional products to help strengthen the skin so that you help um, prevent the breakdown and the reoccurrence of the wound. Thank you. Oh, unless there's any other questions. Um, I think excellent job once again, Wendy. Thanks so much, BTEC, finalist number 10. Thanks so much to our judges, Fiona, as well as Netta. Um, wow, uh, the future is bright for healthcare, Kwame. I want to bring you back on. Um, I'm out of words at this point. I'm just humbled by the amazing presentations and just the breadth of technology and innovation that's going on in our industry. The um, presentations were without a doubt um, superior uh, and they really have shown how thoughtful each one of these CEOs has been in building a company for the long term. So I'm just delighted to be a part of this. Um, I want to make a special note about this uh, message. It's a brief message from McDermott, Will, and Emery, who have been with us for four years now from the very beginning. Uh, but before we go to that brief video, I'd like to bring on the judges. Could the judges please come on camera? 
Ricardo from ResMed, Sarah from Olympus, Netta, hi Netta, Netta from Veronex. Um, I wanna thank all of you for your uh, work leading up to this and for the event today. We wanna to ask that you just wave goodbye to everybody and we wish you well in your deliberations. So say bye. <laughs> oh, and Fiona, thank you. <laughs> all right now. And with that, we will go to our special brief one and a half minute message from McDermott, Will and Emery. Hi, I'm Vanessa Pollard. I lead the food and drug law practice here at McDermott. I also co-chair our global life sciences practice, and I'm a proud founding member and board member of MedTech Color. I wanna tell you a bit about the McDermott RISE program. We launched McDermott RISE in order to help knock down barriers for historically underrepresented groups, particularly Black and Latinx founders and entrepreneurs. Through the McDermott RISE program, we offer 20 companies free legal services each year. Beyond offering legal services, we also connect McDermott RISE companies with other sources of input, perspective, and support to help them grow, scale, and thrive in their businesses. We work across industries and sectors, including life sciences, uh, healthcare, and medtech. Companies like Clinify, Clear Eye Test, and MedTech Color member company, Allergy, are all a part of the McDermott Rise family. To learn more or to apply, go to mwe.com slash McDermott Rise. Here at McDermott, we are proud and honored to work with you to advance diversity and inclusion in MedTech. That was a quality presentation once again. I uh, can't say enough great things about uh, Vanessa. Um, I would say I, just a number of the, the, the network's amazing. It takes a village to raise a med tech and digital health company. I'm proud to be a part of it as well too. Um, I'm excited to kind of just before we get into some special prizes, we just got the word on that. Uh, we wanna give you uh, the opportunity uh, to kind of you know play your role in this whole process of voting, right? So we have a People's Choice Award that everyone on this call, everyone that's on this video can participate in. So you should see a link come up in a little bit, a little bit of a voting tool. You're only gonna have about 30 seconds, right? So take a deep breath. And then if you were an angel investor or if you're just a partner, et cetera, who would you vote for? Um, I can't vote at this point. There's too many to, to, to select from, but let's. I'm gonna run my mouth for a little bit and, and let you guys do the work for a bit. <laughs> well, listen, I wish I could vote as well, um, but uh, I, I'm just like you, Javier. I don't know who I would be. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's tough. It's definitely tough for this round. Um, why we're waiting for um, the poll to come through and for you all to choose the people's choice. Um, do we want to, I believe, announce the special prizes categories? I think that's a good uh, start. So I think you have a special one to kick us off with and I'm going to hop right in after that. Cool. Awesome. So I want to announce that all 10 finalists are going to get a fast pass into MedTech Innovator competition for 2022. It, that is excellent because they get to pitch, they get an opportunity to pitch for $500 thousand um, dollars so that is such an amazing phenomenal congrat opportunity congratulations to all of the 10 finalists um, you know Javier they really you really cannot lose as a finalist in this competition so I know we have special prizes coming up in first second third place but I'm so happy to announce that all 10 people will get that special category Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't agree more with you on that. And then there's beyond the folks that have, you know, that will be taking home some prizes. The exposure that you get with this program has been amazing. We've gotten a lot of inbound from folks from past, present um, that have really benefited from the network and expansion of just making sure that they're a part of that village as well, too. Right. But, you know, let's hop into the first of the special prizes. Right. So this first one comes from TMC, a.k.a. Texas Medical Center Innovation. Um, as a part of this prize, uh, the participant or the finalist will win an automatic entry spot into the 2022 Accelerator Bootcamp with curated engagements and special business advisors, 
health system stakeholders with an emphasis on, you know, focusing on preparedness for studies and really helping out when getting ready for health systems and research institution prep. So a lot of weight that comes with that. So mouthful. Uh, without no further ado, I'd like to introduce the winner of the TMC Innovation Award to Candlelit Therapy. Congratulations. Wonderful. Congratulations to that team. Well, we have another special, and we have a lot of special prizes today, and that's the beauty of this competition. Um, so next special prize is coming from California Life Sciences. This particular winner gets fast-tracked into their program, the FAST program, as they call it. It is a 12-week program that provides review and coaching for your business. Um, it's really a, an excellent kind of educational incubator experience. And the winner of that particular special prize is New Gen DX. So congratulations to New Gen DX. Congratulations. All those people were inside Angelique's office, by the way. I'm, I'm confident about that. Um, shout out to Kentucky as well, too. Uh, you know, moving forward at this point. So we got some more prizes again. We'll get into the top three in a bit. Uh, but next up, we have a couple of our finalists that will, get, will be participating in this wonderful um, opportunity from the Harvard Catalyst post-education program. Um, it's called Transcend, and it's a five-week hybrid course that explores the current climate of MedTech Class 2 and Class 3 uh, uh, regulatory routes. Uh, no small feat. So again, it takes a village. Welcome to it. So uh, a couple, number one, New Gen DX, congratulations. COCAF LLC, as well as TAB Diagnostics. So all three of you, if you can turn your cameras on, congratulations once again. Wonderful. So um, our next special prize is coming from Johnson & Johnson. This prize entails entry, a seat in their J-Labs virtual incubator program, also access and resources to programming, networking, as well as access to experts in the therapeutic area. So this is amazing. Um, I know there are many companies in this competition that would love <laughs> to have access to Johnson & Johnson. They picked out one special one, and that is Candlelit Therapy. So congratulations to Candlelit Therapy. Well done. All right, so we're at our last of the special prizes. We're going to get into some special ones that you have selected as well in a bit. Um, but last but not least, we'd like to introduce the ResMed Founder in Residence Program. So you get to work with the likes of Ricardo de Santos. I got a chance to work with him. Just learning on from the last year to this year. That's quality folk right there, right? So in addition to Ricardo and his wonderful team, you get a dedicated expense, uh, executive sponsor, uh, six months of mentorship from various experts in the industry as well as the company, in addition to a $25,000 grant. Uh, so last but not least, we'd like to introduce Candlelit Therapy once again. Congratulations. <laughs> Kwame, um, wow. Um, how about that? Um, so much more to go. There's so many more, so much more value to extract from this, but oh, I wish we were all in person. I'd be high five and this has been great so far. <laughs> I, uh, I am hyena happy and peacock proud to be a part of this team. And um, I hope that the people who have received these prizes uh, appreciate it as much as I do. It's a, it's a great way to get to the next milestone in your journey. And we're just happy to be a part of it. Um, it's been great. And I believe now we're at the point, Javier and Angelique, where we get into the uh, remainder of the uh, hard dollar prizes. Is that right? Absolutely. Yep. So. And I believe the People's Choice Award has been um, chosen. And so uh, uh -oh. Javier, if you wanna kick us off with that before we get into the, the moment of the hour for second and third place. It'd be my pleasure to be my pleasure. So once again, you, the angel investors, a uh, quote unquote on this call, again, no one's actually investing. So we mentioned this is recorded live, but no, at the end of the day, we're super excited to introduce um, our first People's Choice Award of the MedTech Color Pitch Competition. Uh, congratulations to Wendy and BTech. Congratulations once again. Awesome, awesome. So. So much good stuff going on. Uh, let's bring everybody on camera for a bit, right? This is a special moment. I think we're still in the back in the lab uh, with regards to our judges kind of counting up votes. It's gonna be a special time for us. But again, we really appreciate all of our participants because at the end of the day, um, it's no small feat to change the world of healthcare 
uh, with the amount of systematic, I would say, uh, challenges that we can have at the end of the day, right? So um, it takes the village. Welcome to the village. You're always going to be a part of it, and we look forward to supporting you all moving forward um, for anything that you need. Y'all are family now, as I like to say. <laughs> this, is only, this is only, and for many of you, you've already begun. So this is just another step on the way to the next level for you. Um, and for those particular three that we're about to announce, I just want to let you know what the grand prizes are. So it is a third place prize of $15,000, a second place prize of $25,000, and then a first place prize of $50,000. And again, you are all winners because you've made it as a 10, one of the 10 finalists, you already received special prizes, all of you have, um, and but we want to make sure that uh, we encourage you to keep going further and higher. And, uh, and with that, I guess we, we won't delay the moment any longer. Do we want to kick it off, Javier, with our third place winner? You know what? I want to really bad. I think it's loading right now. I see the little spinner, you know, the old school Apple spinner when it's loading. Uh, right so right now things are going. This is no knock against Apple, by the way, you know, whoever has stopped Okay. It. I think, I think this, that's okay. You know, listen, um, one thing that I really appreciate about this, and I've done a lot of pitch competitions, is that um, all the coaching that the businesses oh, yeah. received on how to execute a pitch. And so since all 10 finalists are going to MedTech Innovator, what an amazing forward prize that everybody has received so that you will be shining your best in the MedTech Innovator competition. I guarantee you, you're probably more well coached than most <laughs> that are going through that. And you all did excellently, especially in three minutes. So that was phenomenal. Absolutely. I agree hundred percent. And we actually had somebody that won last year, uh, Ms. Saldana, if I'm not mistaken, that took home, if not a top three prize, the number one prize. So um, it's a great opportunity. And, and when you talk about MedTech Innovator, it's one of the largest uh, medical device, digital health-ish. Uh, you know, it's kind of a lot of overlap these days in 2022. Um, you, can, you can't speak enough about the number of, of inbound that you get um, um, from the partners that you've seen so far to the angel investors you never knew existed, uh, to folks from the FDA. You can't really miss with it. So definitely take uh, heed in that. I, I can't say enough great things about it. We're diversifying that even more. So that's a win. Um, you're going to see a lot more wins coming from this group as well, too. So we're super excited. And I think we're just waiting on what the official top three should be at this point. Uh, Kwame, any other thoughts on your side? I mean, what are you thinking about? Obviously, I wish we could do this in person, number one. So let's just pray for as the climate continues to evolve. Uh, we could be high five in L.A. I'm, I'm based in Michigan, so my feet are cold right now. Uh, every time my camera's off, I'm blowing on my hands right now. And it's, it's been it's been crazy. How's Kentucky treating you, Angelique? Oh man, Kentucky is it is going hot one day and freezing the next day. We got schizophrenic weather over here. <laughs> so I could use some California sun myself. <laughs> yeah, I need to work on this tan a little bit, you know. But you know, every time I go out there, it's a little cold. You know, it's 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 really humbling to see what's going on in this space right now. And and again, now when we think about um, for those that are just joining us or just are new to us, make sure you go to medtechcolor.org. You can learn more about the, we're going to share more about upcoming programming. So obviously, we talked about one to do this in person. Uh, next year, we will have or this year, you know, fingers crossed, um, the uh, medtech color breakfast where we bring together some of the best and brightest from the industry. Um, so we're super excited. Um, I think we got some some numbers coming in. Um, so I think I'm going to start running my mouth about who's winning now. And all of you are invited to that event as well, too. So if you like to eat like myself, uh, make sure you pull up. We're going to send some more details in a bit. So without any further ado, I'm going to start off with our third place winner. I'm very pleased to share. I know this space very well. So congratulations to our third place winner, winning $15,000, Allergen IQ. Dr. Mariku, where are you at? Awesome. And our second place winner winning $25,000 is Tab Diagnostics. And our first prize winner winning $50,000 is Candlelit Therapy. I want to thank all of the contestants. I want to thank Javier and Angelique again for being wonderful MCs. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll let you all go off camera. 
We talked, we touched on this for a, a few moments, but I want to remind uh, everyone that MedTech Color is not just one program, but multiple programs. Uh, the next big event that we ask you to put on your calendar is for our networking breakfast. And that will be in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. It's part of the MedTech Conference hosted by the world's largest trade association for the medical device industry, Avamed. Uh, this is going to be the largest convening of leaders of color in the medical device industry. And we've been fortunate enough to have past keynote speakers, uh, the likes of Omar Ishrak, the CEO, the former CEO of Medtronic, and Brooke Story, who runs a billion dollar business for BD. So we just can't wait for you to join us uh, for the Avamed Conference in the fall. Well, we are coming to a close and I want to just simply say thank you again uh, and wish you a wonderful, wonderful remainder of the day. Thank you all and we'll see you next time. <music>